Join us this new year for new conversations at the Commonwealth Club. And welcome to today's virtual Commonwealth Club program. My name is Disha Filia, and I'm the author of The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. Our thanks to the Bernard Osher Foundation for supporting today's Good Lit event, and Marcus Books in Oakland for being the club's bookstore partner. It is my pleasure to introduce Amani Perry, Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and author of South to America, a journey below the Mason-Dixon line to understand the soul of a nation. So many people think they know the story of the South, its history and its people. Amani herself was raised in Birmingham, Alabama and makes clear the meaning of American is inextricably linked with the South and understanding both its history and culture is key to understanding the nation as a whole. South to America is a masterful work that weaves together the stories of immigrant communities, contemporary artists, exploitative opportunists, enslaved peoples, and other unsung heroes. We'll be discussing a lot in the next hour, and I want to ask Amani your questions as well. If you're watching along with us, please put your questions in the text chat on YouTube, and we'll be getting to them later in the program. Amani. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Let me start off by saying that I'm especially honored to be here with you today as a fellow daughter of the South, specifically Jacksonville, Florida, where I was born and raised. And incidentally, I'm in Miami right now. Um, if the South is treated like the nation's joke, then Florida is surely the punchline. And unfortunately, so much of the popular discourse about Florida reflects this, and it's really one dimensional and lacking. So I'm going to confess that when I first got my copy of South to America, I just skipped and went right to the Florida essay. <laughs> I knew you would do it justice. Um, and I love that in this essay, um, you consider the many Floridas there are within this state. Um, and there are these many Floridas with borders of geography, culture, people groups, and history. Um, so I'm wondering what particular questions or interests you had at the outset of your research and writing about Florida, and how did the essay evolve from there? Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for being in conversation with me. I am a huge fan and appreciator of you and your work, and also the kind of human being you are. So it's really wonderful conversation with you and the audience probably doesn't know but we have known each other for I think going on 33 years um, although like with a long span not in touch so I'm also just thrilled to be back connected um, so so Florida like Texas I don't have so one of the things I get to Texas at the end of the book but there are people who are like why don't you have a chapter on Tex Texas Florida like Texas is like a nation unto itself in addition to being a state. And yeah. so, um, I decided that Florida to me was the place that would make sense to explore as this place with all the forces. It's almost, it's like a an encapsulation of the history of the Americas. Um, and having known, having, you know, started going to Florida in my very early childhood, because we would, you know, um, uh, from Alabama, um, and knowing different Floridas, like, so that, you know, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd be in the northern part, you know, of Florida, and the, and the Panhandle also, and then the, in Orlando, and Miami, there really are different places, mm -hmm. um, and made different by the geography. And so wanting to capture that and also how it actually gets, allows you to tell a different kind of history of the country, right? Because mm -hmm. it doesn't actually, whatever this project is, it did, doesn't actually start with the British. Right. It's with the Spaniards, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. and, and so it's actually the fact that Florida is a place where, that is 
largely Spanish speaking is not some sort of new intervention. <laughs> it's actually right. where we started, right? With European intervention and the desire for conquest. And so for me, it like, and it, it just was more the kind of reframing that I think we have to do. Um, and also there's an overrepresentation of, you know, Miami is, is in many ways an amazing city, but it's an, there's yeah. an overrepresentation, right? Like, so that I don't think people know how, not just how large Jacksonville is, right? right. The largest city in terms of square footage, but also its centrality in black history in particular. Like there's all these things that I was like, mm-hmm. It's just, it has so many gifts. So I wanted to find a way to help people understand how much it's, Florida becomes an example of all the things that we have yet to discover. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, and the complexity of the creation of the, of the nation, yeah. And so did you, the essay that you ended up writing, is that what you set out to write? Oh, right, that's yes. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it, it was, I think it was much more, I had a lot about um, some of the small towns and a lot about Mariana in particular mm-hmm. um, and early trips. And it just was, you know, it's like the editorial process, you know, where you're just like pruning, pruning to try to make it cohere into something. Also a, a, a lot about Jacksonville in particular and James, the jo- Johnson brothers, because I had written it. So it just didn't, it's not what I set out to write, but it felt like the kind of heart of it became mm-hmm. the thing that people should know is even though there's all these different cultures, mm-hmm. he, there's a structure of relation all over Florida that is the same as the structure of relation in Alabama, that is the same as the structure of relation in, in mm-hmm. um, you know, in, in Virginia, right? Mm-hmm. Like, race and class and all that that's and sometimes we pretend like places that are multilingual or somehow or more multicultural don't have that but that's actually the way the society works and it works that way in part because that's the way it works also in much of the Caribbean and much of Latin Mm -hmm. we have we were all created under the same terms Mm -hmm. around but you know yeah um so you really, in this essay, you really took me to school about my hometown. I'm just going to, you know, put it out there. I'm ashamed to say um, I didn't know. Well, I'm not ashamed of this. I didn't know that there were more Walmarts than any, in, Jack, in, in Jacksonville than any other city in the country. But more importantly, um, I am ashamed to say that I didn't know things like um, that you wrote Jim Crow was less violent relative, I mean, and this is all relative, um, in Jacksonville because it was a resort town that attracted visitors from up north, despite Florida as a whole having the highest per capita rate of lynching in the south. Um, I grew up in a shotgun house, um, which is a type of house you mentioned in the book as akin to a Florida cracker style house, which I never heard of that, <laughs> ever. Um, and I was not aware that Zora Neale Hurston had this, that she had this deep disdain for Jacksonville, and which you also wrote about. So what were the surprises for you in your research on Florida? I mean, that was, this, so the biggest thing really was, I mean, one was the, the, the Cracker House and that, and it partially part of it was like, because I, I did a lot of architectural research. Mm-hmm. But part of what it surprised me about, because there's all these words that are ambiguous. They have all these multiple meanings. Mm-hmm. One of those things where I'm like, there's debates over whether, why it's called the Cracker House, right? Yeah. right. Yeah. And that, you know, we, I don't know, I'm so much more used to the debates around words associated with Black people, you know, right. like, expensive or is it not? So that was, right. but also I was really intrigued by Zora Neale Hurston's disaffection for Jacksonville and how much it had to do with her time at Florida Baptist Academy and this sense of like, there are some, some, I don't know quite how to describe it still. Like I tried to gesture to it, but like there are places where she felt marginalized by other black folks. Right, yeah. And disregarded and in contrast, so her love of her, of, of Eatonville has everything to do with it being a place where she felt um, embraced and tended to and proud of who she was, but that that was not her experience in all Black spaces. I thought that was really important as mm-hmm. her, 
her story, but also to tell us sort of like the complexity right. of, of Florida. So it was like her, you know, she's just this amazing figure for all of us. Mm-hmm. She, her experience became a window into not just the state, but the region. Um, mm-hmm. so that, And then also I had totally misremembered um, the rules of um, going to Disney World. Yeah. <laughs> Don't go, rule number one. But I totally misremembered them. So also, like I had all this stuff about like sneaking food into Disney World. And then I was like, and then it was actually um, an editor. She was like, you don't have to sneak food into Disney World. And I was like having a memory from when I was like 12. It's just not that way anymore. And I was like, but I've been there a lot in the recent years. <laughs> like, so yeah. that, that was also really interesting. Like that the experience of Disney World had, I had a particular idea about what the place was that wasn't. Mm-hmm was an app and it was good that I that that I went back and I love that you you know literally look at the land the land that Disney World is built on and the deception um that it's based on and I won't spoil it anymore for folks who haven't had a chance to read the book but um but you dig deep you dig deep there you dig deep so you know throughout the course of this book and it's just really um a gift to all of us who should know and should want to know about this land. Um, But back to Zora Neale Hurston, um, you write in this chapter um, that our Southern art, our songs, our fiction, our quote, better mimics of our living than dictation could ever be. And as a fiction writer, like I was just swooning at that. Um, But, you know, and I also dabble in essays, but I agree wholeheartedly with that. And so can you talk a bit more about art, particularly um, Southern art and how it can illuminate so much for us about history? Yeah, well, I, you know, I do. (sighs) There's a re, I mean, part of it is this, this thing about the changing same, right? Like that there are ways of doing things that get codified. And so mm-hmm. not like you can't tell an A to Z story and really get at the heart of things. Mm-hmm. It's mm-hmm. about relations and it's about positions people occupy. So the repetition in storytelling, mm-hmm. the way that fiction, part of its magic is you return to it, right? The story, mm-hmm. your story is always there. Same thing with the song and the visual art. It's supposed to be and I think for me this is a part of the aspiration of nonfiction. to be quite honest for me as a creative enterprise is not to write in a way that you get to the end and then you were done that it has produces a different kind of relation when it's more but but I do think you know it is um it's a storyteller's paradise that's I don't think that's exaggerated mm-hmm. you know, it, it's part of that is it's a, there is a way amongst U.S. regions an attachment to folkways that is much more pronounced, where you do yes. tell stories, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know, sing in like a kind like there's a way of being that is much closer to traditional cultures on an everyday basis. Mm-hmm. I think it's really be- that's a that's absolutely a piece of it, um, and it's also insp- you know like so when I talked about like explorers coming, right? And like this incredible lust for power and wealth and the fountain of youth and all this stuff. They're coming motivated by greed and then, Mm -hmm. but there's the other piece where it's particularly Florida is just so beautiful. Like it's just so gorgeous. And it's, it's like, I mean, what else could like, you know, it just ignites the imagination Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in a way that like, and I do wonder, like, so when people talk about places like, you know, Fiji or the Caribbean, like, it's in Florida. Like, it's my backyard where I am right now. <laughs> gorgeous. And it, right, and it does inspire you, right? Like, we are human beings are often mimicking nature. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There's a lot, you know, a lot to be inspired. Like, even just for me, like, wild orchids. Like, I always, like, have, you know, orchids in pots, but wild mm-hmm. orchids. I'm just like, what is this? You know, it's just when you when I read that image, I was because I've never seen that. I've never seen a wild orchid, but that but you know, from your description, I could picture it. And I thought, yeah, only in Florida. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's different too. I mean, uh-huh. so it 
But it's, it, it ignites. Yeah. I just think there's so much that ignites the imagination and also to think about that existing alongside mm-hmm. violence, you know? Right. Right. Um, so your South America has this wonderful leisurely quality to the pacing that I thought was so fitting for the South, you know, because in my fondest experiences and memories of the South, 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 everything is slow and meandering. And that's how you savor things when you slow down. Um, And so, you know, in in the book, in South America, we move, we flow really from Hurston to Orange Trees, to dollar stores, to Disney World, to the political differences between Latino subgroups, um, to the 2016 Pulse nightclub mass mass shooting in Orlando, to George Zimmerman. and as you said, you know, from this be- the beauty juxtaposed against this violence, it's all there. Um, so reading this essay um, and the book as a whole was also emotionally challenging for me. Um, and I imagine obviously that it was for you to writing it. And so this question is something I think is important for us to talk about as writers. Um, how did you take care of yourself while being immersed in this research and writing, so much of which is painful and haunting and enraging? Oh, thank you for that question. Not, not well enough. I mean, and also because so much of my revising was happening in the pandemic. And so there was both being in the material and the memories And then there was also what happened to me generally in the pandemic where I was constantly being snatched back. And like my memory, my memory without the outside world, my memory took over. Mm -hmm. I had really vivid memories, often of, you know, things that were really horrible, like painful memories. And so I definitely got sucked into a place of, you know, some of it's just kind of a set of, of really horrifying encounters with history and personal history, collective history, experiences of people I loved. Um, and the things, so I did not have a good system of managing it. I do think that something happened though in the process of the pruning, right? And being very deliberate about things that couldn't be explicitly like sort of pull that that actually had a psychological benefit like and I think you know you're a master of of this like the you part of the craft is that you have to you have to treat your reader with care right and so not everything um not to you know like which is not that you protect them from, but it's like, you have to make it possible to even get there, right? And there are some books, and I'll say this, I and mean, there are some books that I still can't get past the first chapter that I know are great, but I just can't do it. So I'm not saying that everybody, you know, that it's the same, yeah. everybody, but um, yeah, but it's also, it was like, it, it also gave me a, a, a vehicle f- to deal with all kinds of grief. Mm, mm-hmm. Because it was- yeah the grief of of all of you know I had before I was writing this book I had had a period of like sort of 10 years of active grief so many people I love deeply had died mm-hmm. and I was coming out of it mm-hmm. when like I was just starting to feel like and the way that I would describe it is I know I didn't look forward to things anymore like mm-hmm. the, the, looking for because my anticipation was always that a disaster was around the corner just coming out of it. And then we all had to be in the house again, but it was a way, but the writing was a way of putting grief in a place. I will say that. And that, Mm -hmm. but I would definitely be trying to find a better ways of managing. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. I think, you know, we don't talk about that enough, particularly as black writers, especially the expectation that we're always going to be mining trauma, whether it's our own or historical or both, because we know they inter- overlap. Um, and so I don't know that we give enough attention to what that costs 
us and how, if we can, you know, mitigate it and how we show up for each other, you know, which is, that's a whole other conversation, you know, but we need to, yeah. we need to, you know, um, I think when some, now I'm, I'm editorializing, when someone creates a work like what you've created here, you know, we have to hold space for what that costs you, you know. Um, and you've touched a little bit on that editing, you know, the things that were, were pulled out. Um, were there some things that were pulled out that you wish that you had kept in, but just, you know, space doesn't allow? Yeah, I mean, I just, I, you know, I had so much about Houston. I had mm -hmm. so much about the histories of Asian communities in the South. Mm -hmm. it was one of those things where I was like, where I knew a lot academically, but I didn't know an, a lot by the field part. And I was like, I just, it wasn't, I didn't feel confident in it. Same with my chapter on Arkansas, mm -hmm. which was important to me, but I just couldn't pull it off. Right. Like I was like, I just have to come back to that at some point because I was interested. I also had written some about Missouri. Like I was interested and, in, you know, I didn't really have much to say about Oklahoma, but I was interested in these places that are like not South, but symbolically Southern or yeah. are South, but not South in the way that the other parts of the South are, but are symbolic. Like I wanted to talk about that. Like what mm -hmm. are the boundaries? Because I did it with the upper South. What are the boundaries of the South? So that's the thing that I. I miss and I miss putting it and I and just like just to go back to the beginning because you know I had more about because I was born in Birmingham I moved mm -hmm. away as a kid and I was going back and forth I have a lot of thoughts about more thoughts about how identity formation mm -hmm. happens and why like and now in interviews I'm talking about like why it's home it was always home but I, I do wish I had written where I had included more of my writing about what it means to hold fast to a home and actually how much it had to do with being in Massachusetts, because like just a little thing, for example, the, the black girls in, in Boston who I could do things with because they had the same rules as me were the Caribbean girls, right? Like, so they also were, you had to wear, you know, pantyhose and slips and mm -hmm. I remember <laughs> slips, <laughs> right. but it was, so they were, it was this interesting thing where we were very different in some ways culturally, but also similar because of certain kinds of traditionalism, mm -hmm. you know, is also part of why home became such an important referent for right. me. Right. That I thought was, so would have been interesting is like going kind of full circle with what ending up in the Caribbean. So, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, um, I want to talk about this question of permission. Mm -hmm. So um, for folks who don't know, my collection of short stories is about Black women, sex, and the Black church. And um, I was in a book club conversation once, and uh, almost everybody in the book club was feeling it. And I could tell this one woman was not, because she just kind of had that look on her face. And she asked the question, and she said, you know, are you, do you consider yourself in the church or not? And if you don't, has anyone challenged your right to write about these things? So basically, did I have permission to critique the church if I was not, you know, a part of it? So I want to talk to you about that question of permission. Um, and I think, it, and so kind of broadly and then more narrowly, broadly, I think sometimes as writers in general, we're waiting for somebody to give us permission. And so this might, that might be a question for you as a writer in general, not just South to America, but then most specifically, um, did you, what, where did that authority come from to say, one, I'm going to write about all of these places in the South. And I'm going to say that this, we can't understand America until we understand this. Yeah. So I think permission is, is complicated. Mm -hmm. And I have decided not to ask for permission quite some time ago, right? Like with, you know, when I wrote about Lorraine Hansberry, there were people yeah. furious at me for writing about her identity as a lesbian, like angry. And I said, so she can only be black. 
she can't be queer. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, one, it's clearly was important to her. Otherwise, all of these materials would not have been preserved in a particular folder with the pseudonym. Like, I mean, it was so true that she was waiting for a time in history. Yeah. But it's too important. Like, yeah. I just, I mean, I think, you know, it's fine if people are upset and say you shouldn't have done this and what have you. I'm open to, you know, I, I, this is why I'm always saying I don't write anything as authoritative. It's all mm-hmm. invitation discussion. But if I, these issues are too important to like, to me, if I know, if I have a feeling that this is part of what I'm here to do, mm-hmm. I'm going to do it. Um, now I will say with, there are things that I did not say because of loved ones, just like when I, you know, I, there are things that when my, if my kids are like, don't write that, I won't write it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, like kind of at an intimate level, but I, I, I do feel like the years of study and thinking and experiencing and being in all of these different regions. And I, you know, there's a cost. I had a homesickness for most of my life. There's a cost to moving around a lot, but the benefit is that I saw something and I, I say, you know, okay, well, I'm supposed to say something about what I've seen and other different things, you know, like I have a, I have a, a fascinating experience now where people are sending me messages. They're overwhelmingly white men from Northeastern cities who really irate. Um, I mean, I have lovely messages too, but are saying overstated this. I'm from here. And I'm, and, it, and I'm like, oh, this is an interest. Then they start with saying, you know, I liked your interview, but, but, and, <laughs> but it's also, it is a response to th- I think in many instances, because they tend not to be real critiques, but it's like, how dare you like say what you think about what this nation has been? And I'm like, because you clearly feel like you can say it. So why shouldn't I say it too? I mean, you know, we each speak our piece. Mm-hmm. I think the benefit, I think that has come in part the you know, the, the benefit in the midst of the ways in which black women are seen as not being authoritative is that we have the capacity to receive, um, you know, critical engagement with much Mm -hmm. more curiosity than I think many other groups of people and therefore teach how to be both confident in what you say and also have enough humility to be welcoming to other people to say what they have to say, you know? Yeah. And I think that if we don't broach these subjects, you know, nothing changes, you know, and maybe I'm, I'm naive in that, but not talking about something has never, you know, brought about revolution at all. And so I'm, you know, thinking about the, this, this, the, the, the reckoning the country has yet to do around white supremacy and, and racism, and then the reckoning with the church around um, all of the, the, oppression and and gendered violence and um, misogyny and abuse and all of those things. Um, You know, it's interesting that the perpetrators are saying, wait a minute, (laughs) you know, we have not given you permission to to talk about this. Um, For me with Catholicism, that's it, it becomes a whole other. Yeah. Because I, you know, sort of in my own weird way, devout Mm -hmm. and children and I was like, how can I baptize them as Catholic given what this church has done to children? I just couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. It wasn't like I had a disaffection at a gut. I just couldn't, I was like, I couldn't make that choice for them. Right. But I think that these are the, we have to ask these questions. Right. Right. Um, So let's talk a bit more about the reception um, to the book. Can you tell us your favorite response? Have you had one that, you know, made you laugh, made you cry, made you smile? I mean, I just love um, the warm messages from older people who are like, I saw my home. This was my home. How, like I had a, a friend say, how do you know about gigging fish from just <laughs> South Korea? I didn't know that. <laughs> it just was so, and I said, you know, the set ice. I have spent much of my life trying to be up under older people. That's why. Me too. Me too. <laughs> yeah, I think that's There's something to that. Yeah. And trying to, you know, and thinking that they are the best teachers. So 
Mm-hmm. That that fe- when people recognize themselves and their stories, that has been the best part. Um, yeah, I think that by far. And also, I mean, every time, and I will, this will happen again once we get off of this conversation. I have gotten so emotional about writers who I admire engaging with me and coming to book. I mean, it's just, you know, um, I'm a reader first and foremost, like that's the primary, like, and so, and I am so in awe of writing, (laughs) you know, that is right. Like, so then when you have the experience of writers being like, like you and, um, lots of writers showed up when at the launch event too. And I was like, gosh, Nicole Chung last night. I was like, ah, like they these are people who made those worlds, yeah. right? That thing is just, and my mind is still blown. That's going to be a while before I can like even figure out how to talk about that feeling. Yeah. Well, know that it is so mutual, you know, even just reading your introduction, it just felt like sitting across from you like this but in person and have hearing you talk, like I could hear your voice, you know, sometimes in, with fiction, we talk about writers being voicey and I was like, Imani is voicey, you know, yeah. um, because you're telling a true story, but like, a, you know, just mas- like a master storyteller. And that just showed up in the introduction. And so I was like a historical beach read. <laughs> Yes. Like that's how it felt, you know? And then in the Florida chapter, there was a part where you wrote um, contrasting wash rags with soft washcloths. Right. (laughs) And I just had to sit with that because um, you were talking about memories, you know, so much of of, um, South to America in, in the Florida chapter in particular did take me back home, you know? to my little shotgun house and the wash rags and not the soft washcloths. Um, so that just, that sense of being able to, you know, evoke for readers, um, uh, you know, and, and especially readers our age where sometimes we've gotten away from that yeah. because it was older people in our lives who created our worlds and they're not here anymore. Um, and so you gave us, you get, you gave us that back. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm not gonna tear up till afterwards. <laughs> I'm gonna try, I'm gonna try. Um, what do you, you know, I'm, I'm sharing what, you know, the book has meant for me. When you, um, this is kind of like a two-parter. When you sat down to write, what did you hope readers would take away uh, from the book about Florida specifically and about, you know, the South and this country as a whole. And then what are you finding, you know, did you kind of hit the nail on the head or has something else happened that you didn't anticipate? Um, that's such a great question. So the first part with Florida specifically, I really, I did feel like I wanted people to stop saying that South Florida wasn't the South. (laughs) Right. Right. (laughs) Or that Florida is not the South. Like I would hear that from people. Yeah, because people, but people only say that because they only think about South Miami. Right. Right. Miami or sometimes Orlando, but you know, Mm -hmm. and also that it's, it's multilingual, multi-ethnic, multicultural matrix means that it's somehow something altogether. I mean, I think people do to Florida the same thing that people do to New Orleans, the same thing, like that as though, because it's it's based upon a characterization of the South that's not really true. Right. So then it has to be something apart. So that was my main point. And I did want people to feel like that is true. And also it is one of those states that is like a nation unto itself. Like it has this very, um, you know, it has a, a distinct, it also has a distinct, it is also, it's very Southern and it also has a distinctiveness that's worth attending to. Right. Uh, you know, I, I wanted to, so I will say 
it's hard. I'm not entirely sure what exactly I wanted readers to take away because for me, so much of this book was, you know, I've been working my way away. Like I, I tell people this sometimes and I sometimes like, you should probably figure out a, a better way of saying this, but like part of the reason I became an academic is because I was afraid to be a writer. Mm. And, mm. <laughs> just, so that is what it is. And so, but I've never fit neatly into the academic enterprise. And so part of what I, you know, people are like, oh, you write so much. Well, that's because I was trying to not, because partially because Derek Bell was like, well, just write a lot of stuff since you're going to write weird. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to try it, but it, but to become in a place in my life where I felt like I could be emancipated from the, the voices and expectations of, of university culture. Mm-hmm. What I was trying to do is to reach for a register that felt like it was mine. And, mm-hmm. not, and so, and I wanted to offer that and offer it in a way that was sincere. Like, so that if there are things that don't hit because it is structurally experimental. I mean, with people, it's structurally experimental. It has streams of consciousness at various points. It has, it, it is inside my head, inside other people's heads, and then down the road of history. But that is actually, it's very deliberate, right? Mm-hmm. Like, and, and it's a choice not to write a straightforward narrative, which I've done before, but which was not the thing that for me felt like what I need to do artistically. Mm-hmm. And so, like being okay, like being okay with that in my head is a lot easier than being okay with it out in the world, right? Mm-hmm. Like, <laughs> was that like um, yeah, I know that was on purpose, but it's also like, but I also knew that you, you know, this person, that person might not like it, but it's still hard. It's vulnerable. Yes. Yes. Vulnerable, right. So that vulnerability, because I'm the person, like I had several people say to me, Oh, now the fun part begins. No, 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 no. The fun part is not being out of the world. The fun part for me is being in the corner of my room. <laughs> That's the fun part. This part is overwhelming and scary, yeah. vulnerable and hard. I'm grateful mm-hmm. to have an opportunity to do it, mm-hmm. but it's hard. Yeah. I... I, I think I have time for a little bit more for me before we get to questions yeah. from other people. Um, so when you were talking about what's the fun part for you, I remember reading your essay on Gail Jones that you wrote for the New York Times, which was just mind blowing and wonderful. Um, and there's, you, you described sitting on the floor with all of your research um, and it was apparent to me then that that's the fun part for you, you know, that for other folks that might sound like drudgery, but for some of us, like being immersed in our material, in our, our clay, you know, that's the best part because there's all of these possibilities um, and we can shut out other people's expectations and, and voices and, and, and experiment, as you said, and play. Um, and so I'm going to ask you that like dinner party question, but with a little bit of a twist. Okay. Right. All right. So it is the dinner party. It's you, Gail Jones and Lorraine Hansberry. What do you ask them? <laughs> I mean, I probably would ask Gail Jones to like, please stay even though Lorraine is. <laughs> right. We gotta, so we're going to suspend the disbelief. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would ask them both about courage, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, when I think about, I just love how Gail Jones just decided she was going to break all of the way people, right? And one of the things, and it didn't make it into the essay, and I absolutely love the essay that you wrote about um, her as well. I just wanted to say that. I, is that like <laughs> when people like, you know, Toni Morrison and Maya Angelou, all these people wrote about Gail J- Jones, like with the, with, um, gosh, my brain is so bad. 
the first novel. I can't believe it. Corregidora. They would rewrite her prose. So they would like say, it, so they wrote like these beautiful sentences about it, but it was a rewriting of her. And I, first of all, I was fascinated by this, but also mm-hmm. they were trying to communicate it, but her language was so different. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. So the, the courage to do that, I was fascinated. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, what she should just be like, you know, excuse my language, but like, I'm going to write it the way I want to write it. <laughs> right. She did it. I, you know, one, I would be curious to hear about that. I, I really don't know the answer to how she got so interested in Latin America mm-hmm. about that. Um, uh, with Lorraine, I think, you know, for me, the question is, um, and it's also about, about courage. Um, but I also would like to know more about her relationship to family. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, she, she made a political decision, right, that a lot of people have made a lot of, like, like I'm not going to be politically like them bourgeois Black people, like, right. politically identified with the working class, and I'm a socialist, and like, but also there are these moments of such incredible tenderness, and so I think sometimes we, some of us have overwritten the political, and I think it's so important because for Black folks, like to think, you know, her, her father was a hardcore, like, you know, capitalist, but also, you know, Robeson was by their family home. Like, yeah. we have a kind of set of political relationships where mm-hmm. the space of Blackness can actually accommodate a lot of different political ideologies. And so I would love to hear her thoughts about that, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And some more of the gossip, like, you know, when she gets. Oh mad at Sydney Poitier. I want to know more about that. Like why should we get so angry with him? Yeah. All yeah. the tea, all the tea. Well, I, we have reached the portion where I must share you now with others, but thank you so much for, for this conversation. Um, I will go to our first question. Um, thinking about the return of um, African-Americans to the South, recently. Are you surprised by this? Oh, no. I mean, I'm not surprised at all. It's people move for better quality of life. Mm-hmm. So houses are cheaper. The weather is better. People. So just, I mean, I think we've so overdetermined like the narrative of the great migration. We talk, I mean, obviously racial violence is a piece of it, but it's also work and it's mm-hmm because white people migrated in the same numbers. It's the bull weevil, right? right? Like, and so I think people move now for the same reasons. There's mm-hmm. more places in the South and you know, houses are less expensive and it's an easier way to live for many people. You know, so, you know it doesn't surprise me. People will always move when to make life a little bit less hard. Yeah. Um, and looking at the South versus the North, do you think, it, is it true that the South can be more integrated than the North? Oh, it is. I mean, it's technically true. Like mm-hmm. neighborhoods are more integrated, schools are more integrated. You know, sometimes when you like, you know, like schools in the deep South are more integrated than New York City, for example, and black kids have higher high school graduation rates than in the Northeast. And, you know, like I think people think, so it is true, but, for me, the point is also that some of the like our romantic narratives about how like we how to pursue racial justice are so deceptive. Like, yeah. just as with gender, intimacy doesn't mean justice. Right? Like, so just like patriarchy yeah. exists with love in you know cishet relationships. Yeah, really, white supremacy can exist with black and white people living very close lives, any groups of people. So mm-hmm. respect, you know, justice, equity, all those things are separate from how close people are, um, really are. I, and and we, we keep trying to talk about, like, it's a sort of hokey way, you know, we talk, you know, friends across, you know, like, if we could just love one another, it's so much yeah. 
right there with I don't see color and right. you know, my favorite when I used to argue with people on the internet I don't anymore and it would be if we could just have coffee you would see that we would have more in common and I'm like that's not so not the point justice yeah <laughs> Coffee. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Why is there such misunderstanding between northern northern and southern communities? Well, I mean, I think that's a great question. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't know that I have all the answers. I would say some of it is just the history. There is a history of sectional conflict. <laughs> it is yeah. that occurs a lot of it. But some of it is that we have, you know. We these national mythologies that have regional variations. Yes, and I'm a hero, <laughs> and so and nobody, no region is heroic. They're all implicated in a lot of mess, right? I mean, when I talk about the Civil War, I always teach it in terms of Black people freeing themselves. Mm -hmm. and the Union could only be successful because Black people went and fought for the. Like to just make clear that even that narrative of a kind of virtuous North is yeah problematic right like and that this you know people these so of course if you know one region is like yeah there's you where all the bad people are right, right. <laughs> like where's our heroic narrative oh yeah you tried to dominate it. I mean so I think that's that's responsible for a lot of it but it's also attitudes because I would say even amongst black folks um you know, part of my defensiveness about the South has to do with people saying, that I, oh, I would be scared to go down there. You know, how do you go down there? Right. Like right. even now when I've written this book. Right. right? <laughs> like, right. Well, all these crimes are happening against us everywhere. You know, it, when you said that, it's just like in um, Breathe. And you were talking about the question like, you know, oh, it's scary to raise Black boy. You know, like how these questions that people bring to you can spark, you know, your, your, um, these wonderful books. Thank you. Cause I get so irate. <laughs> Let's write the books that make that we're about, about what we're angry about. Yes. I'm for that. <laughs> uh, someone wants to know if the book will be available on audible. It is available on audible. I read it. Yay. Okay. All right. I got to get that. Fussed with the sound engineer. Say that again. Fussed with the sound engineer who kept telling me things. I was pronouncing things incorrectly. Oh. That's how I grew up pronouncing it. I'm going to say it that way. <laughs> so that was yeah. interesting cultural. And you know, that that's a whole other book publishing conversation about when your book gets to copy editing and the copy editor wants to change Finna to something else. Not that that happened to me. I had a fantastic copy editor, but um, you know. Yeah, Fena is a word. <laughs> it's a word. But I did, I had a, my, the copy editor was a Floridian. Oh, okay. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Got all, but yes, I've ex had that experience in the past. Yeah. Catty Corner was one of them. People kept changing it to Caddy Corner. And I said, no, I grew up saying it Caddy Corner. Caddy Corner. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> so we're not. I remember yeah. the first time I saw Caddy Corner in, a, in print and I was like, what is <laughs> I had to use context clues. <laughs> That's not what we said. Um, let's see. Princeton has an interesting connection to the South. How do you like Princeton and the changes it's making? <laughs> um, there's a reason that Princeton was called uh, the Southern Ivy. Although there's like 10 schools called the Southern Ivy, probably more, but... <laughs> You know, New Jersey itself, like one of the things Baldwin said is New Jersey was his first experience in the South, right? That it had a kind of a Jim Crow order mm, mm -hmm. much longer and a relationship, an active relationship to sort of a, a slave society much longer than other places in the region. And that's very apparent, you know, mm -hmm. shift African-American studies just moved offices, offices, buildings, but the one we used to be in had had an, an auction of black children in front of it historically. So it's very apparent. It is a, it remains, there's a lot of changes in the sense that it is much more, it is overtly more inclusive. It is also a, a city that is tied to the conservative South very explicitly. Our campus center is named for Senator Frist. This, you know, it's, so it is what it is, right? Mm -hmm. 
um, I, I like it because I like my department, which has some incredibly wonderful scholars of African-American studies and, and black diasporic studies. Mm -hmm. Traditionally, you know, I don't know, all of these institutions are so deeply implicated in the status quo that is so fundamentally unjust. And so many professors try to justify, yes, liberal, liberal education is meaningful and we should have all kinds of ideas, da, 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 but there also are engines of the status quo. And if you think the status quo is unjust, you have to acknowledge that you become implicated, you have, you have unclean hands. So that's how I feel about it. I try to undo some of the damage that I think the institutions I have been aligned with do in the world. And as Yale alum, I feel, as a fellow Yale alum, I feel that acutely. Um, going back to what we were talking about, um, permission, what advice do you have for writers and thinkers about navigating spaces where inquiry isn't always welcome? Oh, I mean, you have to have some space, I would say, like, so that I'm a, I'm a big fan of alternative spaces, right? I mean, I think, and to go back to the point about, about Yale or about any other, other places that, or even the places, places that I've worked or gone to school or just been, the m most significant part is the, un the, the part that wasn't the official participation, right? Like the alternative spaces, the creation of relationships with people who also want to ask questions that are not seen as acceptable questions to ask, the places where, I'm not thinking about this, Yesterday, because I was thinking about when people ask that question, like about and Beverly, um, Beverly Daniel Tatum wrote that book about why are all the black kids sitting together in the cafeteria, mm -hmm. and I'm about how those spaces are actually the spaces where traditions are built. Mm -hmm. When when we're no longer for black folks, when we're no no longer all in HBCUs, right? So that like people develop, and, and so traditions like cultural traditions, but also like political traditions, right? People develop alternative spaces and they become ways of being connected with each other over time. Mm -hmm. Very like to be on the outskirts of certain can be actually a wonderful place to develop a sense of belonging to a longer tradition mm -hmm. in that place, but not seen as officially in that place often, right? Um, like, so yeah, so, so I think that that's the thing is you have to find your people wherever you go. Um, and even, and sometimes your people aren't at your exact institution. They might be in the town or they, right. might, you know, and I, I, but I think other people are just so, and it's so important too, because writers are often, we're fed this fiction that we are solitary, but yeah, you, yeah. you have to have interlocutor. You have to have community. You just do. Yeah. And I think the, uh, I would, add to that in terms of, you know, inquiry where it isn't welcome. Um, I think leaving room to be surprised, oh, it's by, <laughs> you know, by the people who initially like, oh, you know, I wasn't thinking about this inquiry or these questions, or I was avoiding these questions. But then it goes back to what you were saying about the, the power of art and story, it, it, that you can engage somebody with a really good story that begs the questions, then I think sometimes people are more willing um, to engage. And then there's something that, you know, this is part of the skill of, of being a writer, I think, where you can, um, you know, really you're going for the jugular of something and not necessarily the person, but the institution and the traditions that harm, um, but doing it in a way that um, it's nuanced. You know, it's nuanced. I don't think it's necessarily being soft because I, I don't think, you know, either of us have ever been soft in any of this, in the things we write, but there's just the way that you can do it. Um, like for me, it was important that my book didn't seem like a middle finger to the church, even yep. though challenging the church, Everywhere. you know, on all of those things. And, and I wasn't looking for permission, but there's a, a way that, you know, that, I don't know, you know, it's like, you know, you know it when you know it. <laughs> so that's so important. Uh, let's see. Um, in South Carolina, 
Uh, this, this person says, in South Carolina, where I grew up, people considered North Carolina a totally different place, like no relation to South Carolina. Did you uncover anything about why they may have felt that um, that may felt, have felt so important to them? You know, I can't answer that, that specific question. I think it's a great question. And I've experienced it just from being in both places that they seem so different. I wonder if it has to do with the colonial history of South Carolina in comparison that North Carolina, so much of it is much newer. Um, mm. And um, yeah, and also the different crops, but I don't know. That's a really interesting question. Um, but I am, I'm, I mean, I did try to like think about, <sighs> You know, there one of the, the the mechanisms I use just, and this is partially just because of where I teach. Like I will say things, like I'll tell people things, like um, students. You know, the black population of Alabama is the same as the population of all of Trinidad. Mm. Right, like to make some of these comparisons because these are places unto themselves, like that have right, right. histories. <laughs> just the population thing makes people start to think differently. And that's sort of why it's weird that like, I find myself now so often, because I'm talking about the book saying the South, the South, because it's South, right? And and even within the same state, there's so much as you well know, right? There's so much. Um, I love that that point, the question, even though I can't answer it, the question is important because that repeats all over the place. Right, mm-hmm. it's so different from any place that I know intimately. It's mm-hmm. not- I mean, and, and it goes back to something you said about the country as a whole. Like, slavery is this nation's shame. Yes, and so it's you know it's very easy to be like, oh, that happened down there, and so we're going to treat the South like it's not really you know as if this whole country like talk about complicit as if the whole country wasn't complicit and I think there's just still that distancing um and you know one of the problems I have with that distancing is people forget like you said within the state like you know that meme of Bugs Bunny song Florida off (laughs) let's think about all the Floridians all the black Floridians that are there all the Floridians who you know are fighting for justice so this idea that a whole state you know, um, I think it, it's definitely to make those of us who are not in whatever state that is feel like we're the good ones, as you, you know, alluded to earlier. Oh, true. There was a um, there was a, a rapper, Jim Jones, who's from New York, who had a, you know, described a sort of unsettling situation with his mother. And and it was like it had got this hullabaloo in the hip hop press, but people were responding to it. What in the Alabama? in response to his mm-hmm. abusive. And I was like, wow. Like, and he's this person is completely New York. And I was like, wow, it's just so, it's so deep. Mm-hmm. The disrespect. Yes, it's very disrespectful. <laughs> well, we have come to the end um, of our conversation. Um, our thanks to Imani Perry, author of South to America, a journey below, oops, I have it right here, a journey below the Mason-Dixon to understand the soul of a nation. We encourage you to pick up your copy of Amani's book at your local bookstore. And if you'd like to watch more programs or support the Commonwealth Club's efforts in making in-person and virtual programming possible, please visit commonwealthclub.org events. I'm Disha Fulia. Thank you and take care. <laughs>